welcome to our webinar or our online lecture on autism and the criminal law. We are going to be discussing the issues, particularly for those living with autism and facing criminal charges, and a particular case involving an appeal for a, an applicant called Alex Henry. We have two very distinguished speakers today. Uh, Professor Andrew Rowland, who's been qualified as a doctor for just under 21 years, as you will have seen in our invitation, he has a portfolio career as an NHS medical director, consultant in children's emergency medicine in Manchester, honorary professor in the School of Health and Society at the University of Salford, non-executive director of an international non-government organisation in Cambodia and chairman of the board of, of, of Sick Kids. He has a specific interest in children's advocacy and children's rights uh, and the development of early warning systems in emergency medicine and safeguarding vulnerable people. Um, we also have Dr. Claire Alili, a reader in forensic psychology at the University of Salford in Manchester, an affiliate member of uh, uh, the Gothenburg University in Sweden. Her PhD in psychology from the University of Manchester uh, and her other uh, significant academic qualifications have focused uh, particularly on the issues that arise for those people who are autistic in criminal justice systems and particularly in um, cases involving very serious crimes such as terrorism, homicide uh, and so forth and particularly looking at how autism symptomology can contribute to different types of offending. Now, I should have said when we started, this uh, lecture is being recorded. So if you have a problem with the recording, um, I apologize for that. I'm hoping you'll all stay with us. It will be recorded. And what we do is post the recording. We also write up what we've said in an article for the Libertas Lens. So those of you who would like to receive that article, um, please register for our Libertas Lens. And I'm hoping Gary will put in the, um, chat box how to do that, um, how to register to receive our Libertas Lens updates. And I can see Gary, our clerk, uh, nodding. And attached to that article will be any slides that we produce today. So for your reassurance, everything we say will be recorded and written down. I hope that's helpful afterwards. The only other thing I want to say, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Felicity Gary, Queen's Council. I've been a member of or an ambassador for the Advocates Gateway for over a decade, producing toolkits for advocacy with vulnerable people. I have a particular interest in cases involving autistic suspects and defendants, and thinking now about how we can move from just procedural adaptations where we attack adapt the way we speak and communicate to enable effective participation to how autism is relevant to substantive law. So in Alex Henry's case, how autism might be relevant when one is charged with committing a crime uh, following the law of complicity that used to be known as joint enterprise. So those are the issues that we're going to cover today. But to give us a start, uh, I'll hand over to Andrew Rowland, who will, uh, I think the way I like to put it, Andrew, is to explain how you get the same people in your clinic as we get in our courts. And what we're going to hear from you is the way in which you approach these issues as a clinician, which I think will be of real interest to those of us working in the criminal justice system as lawyers. So over to you, Andrew. We, we are likely to go over our hour. Um, as you've already guessed, I talk a lot so, and there's a lot to cover. So um, hopefully we can do this in about an hour and a half. Andrew, off you go. Thank you very much, Felicity. Now, I want to try and uh, share some slides. So if somebody could please tell me if you can see a PowerPoint slide on the screen. I can see trees and a green tent. Mm, um, yeah. Well, that's not where I'm sat, but <laughs> let's have another go. Now I've got the slide on the screen. Yes, I will I not share. Ah, oh, you can see it. Oh, can okay. you see? 
Can you see something that says you can't stay in your corner of the forest waiting for others to come to you? I can't. No. No, okay. No, not no. Yet. No. Maybe can anybody, you can anybody help me out? You may need to specifically select the uh, PowerPoint presentation from the share screen menu. What to do if you if you click the stop share, uh, sharing button and then click stop share sharing. screen again? Yep. Yeah. Once, once you stop sharing, if you click the sh uh, share screen button again, you should see that it gives you an, uh, gives you both a list of screens and applications. If you hey. yeah, yeah, there you go. There Thanks, is. Andrew. Whoever's just talked me through yours. that, you're amazing. <laughs> yeah, that's what expert. <laughs> I, think <laughs> I think it was Andrew Jackson. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Hi, Andrew. Yeah, I, uh, so, uh, good to see you again. Uh, hi, that's brilliant. Glad, glad so we're, we're ready to we're ready to go. So. Uh, thank you very much uh, for the introduction, Felicity. And I, I think probably a lot of people who are invited to come and give a talk will often say, I'm really delighted to be here. But I am genuinely really delighted to be here because I hope that um, in a few short minutes, what I can do is to give you some clinical tips that we use in clinical practice that I know that legal practitioners, lawyers, other people who are working within the judicial system will be able to rapidly implement into their own practice with no cost, no expense to anyone and without any massive changes. So just a few declarations of interest that uh, are on the screen, but Felicity has been through these already. So I'm from the University of Salford, from the um, Centre for Social and Health Research. Um, in the slides that you'll get afterwards, I'll put a link to the research work that we've been doing. And we've got a particular focus on children, young people and families. And that's our research Twitter address on the screen. Through our work over a number of years, we have um, found that there are a significant number of issues that affect children and young people in the UK today. Adverse mental health, issues to do with equality and diversity, and included within that we would incorporate people who have a disability, uh, who people who have a learning disability, people who have an autistic spectrum disorder. There are issues of poverty, of bullying, substance misuse, domestic violence, obesity, child abuse, and a whole host of other things. What has all of this got to do with why I'm here tonight to talk to you about autism in the criminal justice system? Well, I think if you look at that list of things that we know affect children and young people, and I pick those specifically because, yes, I'm a paediatrician, and yes, I see uh, patients who have autism, children who have autism, but they grow up to be adults with autism. And I think if you look at um, the list of things on the screen now, you'll see there really is no difference between the kinds of things that we see in clinical practice, in our health services, in our waiting room, in our emergency departments, in our clinics, and the people who attend um, court, the people who you represent, um, the people who are in the court building and are some way involved in the criminal justice system. So um, I make no apologies for this, but I told you at the start that I was a paediatrician and this is the title of my talk. You can't stay in your corner of the forest waiting for others to come to you. You have to go to them sometimes, as Pooh Bear and Piglet said. Now, what has that got to do with autism and the criminal justice system? Well, our research took us from the UK to Cambodia. And we've been working in Cambodia since 2015. And that's important because when we started working in Cambodia and doing clinics in Cambodia and uh, involved in training of uh, health practitioners in Cambodia, I started to see in my clinical practice in Cambodia a significant number of patients coming to the clinic who very clearly had an autistic spectrum disorder. But at that particular time, there was no word uh, for autism in Khmer, in, in Cambodian. Um, so we had to work together as a clinical group to look at what symptoms people had and how that was going to be translated into Khmer so that the local 
people could actually describe actually what these patients were suffering from with a diagnosis. Actually, after all of that happened, it was decided that the Khmer word was actually going to be autism. But it's the process that we went through that was important. So we, we've learned some things from the people who live in, in really uh, tragic situations, in real poverty, um, at the other side of the world, which are just as relevant in the UK as they are in Cambodia. So whether or not your shop looks like this, or whether your shop looks like any supermarket that you go to in the UK, there is a common link um, between our communities. And that is, that we have children here in the UK who have autistic spectrum disorders, just as we have in Cambodia. But because there hasn't been the treatment in place and the recognition in place in Cambodia, um, we're seeing a lot of presentations of children who have uh, advanced in their diagnosis without intervention. So I've seen people um, who present who don't like certain colors, who will only eat certain types of food. Um, children who are able to um, only communicate via drawings or only communicate um, via pictures or by writing in some way that perhaps sometimes that, that, that only they can really understand. And of course, they are growing up to be adults with those similar sorts of conditions. And what I really think is protecting children and young people who will, of course, grow up to be adults. One of the key things that we need to do as professionals is to recognize our roles as community leaders um, and recognize the impact that we can have within our own communities. And that's why I'm absolutely convinced that everybody here today, by just making a small change to your own practice, um, the collective amalgamation of those changes together, I think will improve the situation for people who have a disability, who are or people who are disabled, who are involved um, with your services, but specifically people who have autistic spectrum disorders. And that fits very nicely with our other child rights work that we are involved in, which includes work on MG, FGM and it includes work on um, uh, prohibition of physical punishment of children. One of the things we found through our research uh, in a project that was led by an absolutely superb academic social worker I work with called Dr Donna Peach is a new communication model we've devised with children and young people to ask them about sensitive topics in ways that um, might be explained um, in language that they understand and they will be able to respond to or enable them to communicate in a way that they understand and a way that they uh, are used to. And that was used in a pilot piece of consultation that we did with uh, children and young people about the need for advocacy centres. And one of the things that we did there was to enable children and young people to participate in that event, no matter what their communication ability or style was. So we used uh, interpretive dance, we used art therapy, we used an artist to capture uh, things that, that children were communicating in pictures. We had a graffiti wall, we had a wishes and worries tree, there were video diaries, um, there was a play that was put on. There were some children who took part in, in small groups. There were others who were prepared to talk to the whole plenary session of 50 or 60 people who were there. All of those methods of communication are relevant in your practice, just as they are in clinical practice, because um, you might find that somebody isn't able to explain themselves in a traditional way because of uh, their autism or because of another condition that they've got. And, and what I'm really advocating for here is recognizing that there are lots of different ways that people communicate. There are lots of different ways that people can try and get their points of view expressed other than just by talking. Now we've taken that one step further um, in our emergency department setting. Um, we're undertaking uh, some research very shortly, hopefully, about music making and how that can can impact on people's ability to to be relaxed and communicate in a clinical setting. And we've also introduced sensory spaces in emergency departments. 
And this is what um, I'm going to finish on. What you see there is, of course, in clinical practice, and you can probably guess that by the oxygen and the suction that's on the wall behind. But actually, these sensory spaces, we know that we have got patients who come to our units who don't like the color green, who will absolutely, you won't be able to communicate them if um, the walls are green or the walls are blue or the walls are red. Equally, we've got some people who come because of their condition only like a certain color or they will only eat a certain color food or they won't eat a different colored food or they will only communicate in a certain way. Those people, as I've said right at the start, are also people who, uh, you know, just because we're all in the same society, are equally likely to be uh, involved in any kind of public sector work or any kind of public sector service, including the criminal justice system, as they are in the health service. So my challenge back to people working uh, in uh, the criminal justice system within criminal law and within the courts is, how far do you go um, to make those reasonable adjustments, which don't need a, a huge amount of money, but you could change the experience for an individual person that could make the difference between um, their conviction or, or, or not, could make the difference between them giving good quality evidence or not. And just to finish on a real clinical example of that, let's just take those colour examples and those food examples. Say you've got a client who is in custody and is going to uh, attend court from custody and they have a particular condition which means absolutely their the, a particular colour causes them severe distress. If they've been held in, a, in the cell below court and it happens to be the colour of that uh, particular uh, colour that causes them such significant distress, are they really going to be in the right way to be able to give evidence in court? immediately after having come from that environment. Just the same as if they are attending court in the morning, the case is not heard till the afternoon and um, they need to get something to eat. If they're in custody and the food is, provi is provided to them, but well, what actually if they can't, because of their disorder, eat a certain color food or certain types of food and that's all that's provided to them, or they have to eat a certain type of food to be able to not be distressed. All of these small things if people can communicate with their clients in advance, people can work out what the best way of having them in a, in a good environment so that they are protected and they're able to, to give the best possible input into something that's going to be distressing for anyone, let alone if you have an autistic spectrum disorder. Um, you can make one or two changes to your own practice to think about how you could help clients in a very different way. Um, that's a lot um, in a few minutes introduction here. But, and that's why I say you, you can't stay in your corner of the forest waiting for others to come to you. We went to Cambodia. You don't need to go to Cambodia. Perhaps just going to your clients' needs, perhaps just going um, along with what they need rather than necessarily what the system provides is the change that you can make. Thank you very much. And um, I'm going to hand over to Claire as soon as I can work out how to stop sharing the screen, which should be like that. Thank you, Andrew. Um, this... um, Felicity, you're on mute at the moment. Thank you very much. Uh, for those of you listening in, we're going to hand over to Claire now. Before she starts, I can hear very loudly people working in the criminal justice system saying, goodness me, would we have to get a judge to do interpretive dance? And to which the answer is, of course, yes. And the amount of times that you have been in a cell with a client and you've almost danced around the room to try and explain the direction of something or where things are moving. We move about in order to try and explain those things. And it's not about getting judges to do the interpretive dance. It's about getting the whole criminal justice system to adjust itself for the needs of the particular people in court, and that might include a suspect as well as a, a witness. Um, we're now going to hand over to Claire, whose experience is assessing, if, I don't know if assessing is the right word, but thinking about autism and the way in which we uh, criminalise people with autism, if that 
is the right expression. Thank you, Claire. Thank you. Um, it, thanks, Andrew, as well. Thanks, Fosti. So I'm going to look at autism in the criminal justice system and look at it from a whole criminal justice perspective. So I'm really interested in how different symptomologies of autism or features of autism can provide the context of vulnerability to engage in a range of offending behaviours. And as, as Felicity mentioned at the start, extreme versions like homicide, terrorism, but also sexual offending, such as the viewing of child, um, decent child imagery, um, hands-on sex offending, uh, cyber crime, hacking, um, violent crime, you know, arson, oh, the whole gambit I'm really interested in. And certainly when you really look and investigate it, there are features of autism that can contribute to all types of offending behaviours. So at the University of Salford, myself and my colleague, Dr. Tony Wood, who's a lecturer in criminology at Salford, we formed and founded together the Autism and Criminal Justice System Hub. And this is a centre at Salford that we're really hoping to really pull together knowledge about autism and offending and autism in the criminal justice system to really just increase knowledge and awareness of, the, of this issue and the importance of really looking at this. And I'll explain this in more detail as I go throughout this presentation as well. So I'm gonna first, first very briefly mention what, what is autism? So autism currently, according to the DSM-5, the, the psycho, Psychiatric Bible in effect, it defines autism as being a disorder with two core areas of impairment. These two core domains or areas of impairment are impairment in social communication and interaction, and also impairment in the sense that there are significant restrictive repetitive behaviours, interests and activities. And it's really important that, you know, having knowledge of autism in one person is, is not sufficient because every single person with autism is so different. As Lorna Wing correctly said many years ago, once you've met one person with autism, you've met one person with autism. So it's really important that whenever you see someone with autism in the criminal justice context, that they are taken on a case by case basis. You can't generalize from one case to the other. In clinical practice, autism is typically looked at as being a spectrum. And even our, everyone in this room might consider autism to be from really, really severely impaired to very high functioning individual with autism. And it is everything in between. But for, from a legal or forensic context, looking at autism in this way is actually really potentially really damaging and detrimental to that individual. Rather, it's more important to look at autism as being a symptom or a, a, sorry, a disorder where there's both strengths and weaknesses. So that individual has a unique profile where there's varying levels of, of strengths and weaknesses that differ from another person and their strengths and weaknesses. So it's really important to look at autism in this way. I give this as a really good example to depict this. So on the right hand, on the left hand side, you'll see a pie chart and each of the pies refers to a particular area of autism that's typically impaired. So you've got sensory sensitivities, uh, communication difficulties, social impediments, the intense focus and interest, and the routine and repetition element. On the right-hand side of this slide, you will see three hypothetical individuals, A, B, and C. If you look at individual A here, they have got significantly um, intense focus and interest. Whereas if you look at their communication difficulties, there's not, they're not that impaired relatively. But if you look at person C, they're markedly impaired with their social communication difficulties and maybe not as impaired in other domains. And the reason why it's really look at, important to look at autism in this way is because person A presenting to the police or in the court context may on the surface appear you know, very um, non-impaired through their autism because they're so articulate, they're verbal, they're intelligent, they may, may be in a professional job. Where, and so they would not be picked up as being vulnerable. Whereas person C, it's potentially more obvious that, that person has an underlying vulnerability. So this is why I think it's really important to look at autism in this way, this kind of pie, um, because often in the courts you'll hear the defendant is mildly autistic or is a mild autistic individual or is very high functioning. And this almost negates some of the, the features in that individual's autism that is actually hugely detrimental to them. So while they're very verbally articulate, they may be hugely impaired and may have a particular sensory sensitivity or um, a particular restrictive interest that is hugely debilitating to them in their everyday life. 
and but they appear on the surface to be relatively impaired. It's important to also point out here that when I look at some of the risk factors and vulnerabilities to engaging in offending behaviour in people with autism, it's important to highlight first that individuals with autism are actually no more likely to engage in offending behaviour than the general population. And in fact, some recent studies have shown they're actually less likely to engage in offending behaviour. And if you imagine autism as being someone who likes structure and routine and following sort of a guideline, that the law really is very appealing to those individuals. Nevertheless, there's a small subgroup who do offend, and it's really important to look at in that subgroup what potential features of autism may have provided that context of vulnerability to engaging in that offending behaviour. And some of the most common ones include the social naivety. Uh, their restrictive interests can also lead to offending behaviour, and you know, so their pursuit of that interest and not understanding the wider consequences of that can actually lead to um, them being charged as well with an offence. I'll, I'll provide some examples later as well. They'll have difficulties with theory of mind, so a difficulty with understanding someone else's perspective and that someone else's perspective, you know, and beliefs and thoughts and intentions is different to theirs. So if they like something and they feel happy with an interaction, they may not consider that that one person will not be feeling the same, that the other person actually might be trying to escape that situation and be having feelings of stress or upset. There's also emotion regulation difficulties. And so one of the things that that links to is impulsivity. So some of them uh, also may act very impulsively. So for instance, there's a case by C on 2015 in the literature where there was a man with Asperger's who was carrying a tree of food through this cafeteria. And a woman was on a mobile phone walking by, didn't notice him and bashed into him. And his food tree went everywhere, spilling the food all over his clothes. This led him to be really upset, not just at the loss of food, but all the food on his body. And it was he was getting really, really kind of upset and stressed and anxious. And the, this individual, you know, in a nice gesture, reached out to, you know, to clean the food off his clothes. But his sensory sensitivity was touch. And he found this extremely, extremely overwhelming and distressing and, and just kind of flipped his hand out as if to say, you know, get away, you know, you know. So it wasn't like maliciously intent to harm that person. But the, the, the touch of on him was enough to, you know, he was just really distressed at that. It wasn't like um, deliberately trying to aim to hurt this individual. Also, what's really important to consider is that many people with autism, usually they, they tend to have another disorder. So comorbidity, so that's where a person with autism has another disorder, where it be psychiatric or neurodevelopmental, is more the norm than the exception. And what is found in the literature is that when an individual with autism is, uh, you know, you know, convicted or as a suspect, they tend to have other psychiatric disorders as well. And it's those other disorders that really increase and exacerbate that individual's ability to cope. And so a lot of the literature as well shows that uh, Newman and Gazidian in 2008, for instance, did an excellent review where they showed that a lot of the literature um, has individuals with autism who also have other disorders that have engaged in offending behaviour. So it's really important to look at the, the interaction effects of that as well. Just a case study here of an individual with autism in the literature that engaged in violent behaviour. So this individual was reported by Mawson in 1985, and they described this young autistic man who had a number of violent fantasies, and he had an extensive interest in poisons, and he had assaulted women for a number of idiosyncratic reasons. So he was aged 18, he dropped a firework into a girl's car and then stabbed her in the wrist with a screwdriver. And his reason for this was that he was jealous that she had a car and that he did not like women drivers. So it was his strong views and, and his you know, idiosyncratic beliefs and motivations that really drove that offending behaviour rather than a need, an intrinsic need to harm that individual. Only eight months later, he jumped in the back of a girl in a park and it's because of the way she was dressed. She was in a short, a short skirt and he, he, he took this um, very negatively. And at 22, he was upset at the sound of a neighbor's dog and he kicked the animal and struck the owner and a girl, uh, who was a girl with a screwdriver. And three years later, he was assaulted for um, trying to stop this young child in a railway station from uh, making a lot of noise. Um, no serious injury was caused in any of these incidences, but what has essentially happened here was that he didn't like the sound of any loud pitched voices. And so this young child screaming 
really caused him real significant distress and he would do anything to try and stop it. So he wasn't actually trying to hurt the child. Indeed, he didn't hurt the child. He was just trying to get the child to stop this, this noise. It was so distressing. Another um, example of a criminal behaviour is that of arson or fire setting. And some of the features of autism that can link to this offending behaviour is that the person doesn't understand because of autism that there's implications as a result of that behaviour. They may not actually appreciate that it can cause um, harm to someone, that someone could actually die as a result, or that it's causing damage to property, or that a fire may actually get, get, get out of control. They also may use fire setting as a way to solve problems, and I'll give you an example of that after this slide as well. They may also have impaired victim empathy, so they don't appreciate the impact of what they're doing on other, others, but it's very important to highlight here that it's a misconception that people with autism have no victim empathy or they lack the ability to have any empathy for any other individuals. It's important to look at autism and people with autism, the empathy is, is in two different domains. There's cognitive empathy and there's affective empathy. Affective empathy is what the individual with autism is not impaired on. So when it's explained to them, so the cognitive empathy side, when it's explained, you know, here's the implications of your behavior, here's what it could potentially do to someone. They're effective empathy because they have it. They're like, oh goodness, I can't believe it. So they, it's so they're very different from someone like with psychopathy. Someone with psychopathy would not have effective empathy, but they have cognitive empathy. So they're like the kind of polar opposite, if you like. So it's very important that that's really relayed in courts as well, involving people with autism. They, they're not impaired in empathy, as widely believed. And I think even more crucially is the the kind of vulnerability in people with autism that their restrictive interest may be in fires. So they're really restrictively interested in the heat from the flame. That sensory aspect is really attracting to them. They may really enjoy the flicker of it and, and how it looks visually and that can really appeal to them. And it's that that drives their behavior more than anything else. And there's cases in the literature where there's young boys that grew up to engage in fire setting or an arson and they had a history of being really attracted to this kind of uh, sensory aspect to these flames that were fire. One instance, for instance, uh, a young boy that later was charged and he would spend hours as a young child and toddler staring at that wee fl flicker, that flame you get in boilers. And he would stare at it for hours, you know, totally. And if you were to try and stop that behavior, I'd become very distressed and upset. So that's another thing I think is really important to highlight here when I'm talking about these interests or activities. That this is not just like your local uh, guy down at the bar in Manchester that supports Manchester United and he's talking about the team and he's got the shirt and he visits the games. It's different from that level of interest. For some with autism, the interest is all encompassing. It's, you know, it's to a higher, much higher degree. And that it's, so it's distinct from the kind of general typical, you know, interest that people have in the neurotypical population. Hopefully you can see the top of my slide here because a massive thing that's kind of covered up. But this actually says at the top arson and ESD. Oops. And this is a case of a young guy with Asperger's who was really obsessed with this particular radio station. And he would tune into it at a certain time every single night. And he did this for years. And what happened was they had to move. And he was so obsessed with this radio station that he actually created a special aerial so that he could still tune into that radio station and listen to it. But a year later, a local radio, radio station set up a broadcast that was in the same frequency. And it's caused him a lot of problems in listening to this um, radio station uh, for a few hours every evening. And he wrote a number of letters to this radio station and they either ignored him or sent him back uh, blessings and letters. So because he was getting completely ignored and he tried so many times, he viewed that the only option was to, you know, eradicate this radio station. So he burnt it down effectively. He saw that as his only option. Moving on to sexual offending. This is a case I took from a paper by Milton. And this was a, a guy who was diagnosed with autism and he'd been convicted with three different types of um, sexual offences acquisitive, direct sexual assaults, and indirect sexual assaults. And this man had a long history of being really fascinated with women's genitalia. And in particular, the notion and an idea of a woman being gynecologically examined by a doctor. His interest was so significant, 
so, you know, this is it was so autistic in its severity, if you like, that he actually posed as a medical researcher and would phone up women and ask them a number of questions really detailed about their experiences of being gynecologically examined. And he would frequently masturbate during these calls. So this is another example where the individual's particular restrictive interest really drove the behaviour. And again, that's why I highlighted in the previous slides that you could argue that most heterosexual males, you know, would have this particular fascination with a woman's genitalia, potentially. Um, but with an, this individual with autism, that the intensity of that interest and fascination and need was really, really significant, really severe, for the want of a better word. Two other cases I'm going to quickly mention is from the paper of Haskin and Silva in 2006. In the first case, it was a middle-aged substitute teacher who was um, um, charged for effect, uh, sexual offences because he would he was touching the shoulders of his female students, his adolescent female students, and this was considered, you know, negative. But what it really, what it, what it, um, what they discovered was that actually this behaviour wasn't sexually motivated in any way. Rather, this was his restrictive and kind of repetitive behaviour, like in the same way some people with autism might stimmy or, you know, touch certain things or, you know, you know, do a certain action. It just so happened that his certain action happened to be involved other people. In the second case of Mr. C, this was a deaf man who was referred to outpatient psychotherapy because he was displaying a number of inappropriate sexual offending behaviours. What this young man was doing was, without Asperger's, he was compulsively soliciting, solic solicitating male strangers for sexual contact. And in particular, he was his restrictive interest as well was in males who were like elevator repairmen or you know, builders. He was really, really particularly drawn to those particular men and that kind of activity. And so he'd approach these men when they were doing their, and their, their work and uh, you know, sexually um, uh, uh, kind of approach them. And he did not appreciate at all that this, uh, this was potentially negative behavior and that this could be misperceived and, um, and be treated in a very, they could, it could be, they could get someone who treats this behavior very hostily. And indeed one case, someone actually did take this very negatively and punched him really badly. He was um, badly injured. So again, this is this idea was he was really drawn to his behavior and he pursued it despite th thinking about the wider consequences and the, the, what other people might think of that behavior. And they might view it not positively in the same way that he viewed it positively because of the impaired theory of mind as well. You know, the inability to think that other people might have different thoughts and feelings to what they're feeling about something. This is an, um, an area that I've, I've published in, and it's the viewing of indecent child imagery or the viewing of child pornography. And I've published this paper with Professor Larry Dubin, who's a professor of law in the US. And I was really driven to look at what's being done in relation to child pornography and autism. Certainly, there's a lot of literature looking at sexual offending autism. And when I say a lot, I mean relatively a lot. But there's, I was interested in like, okay, what's been done on child pornography or the view of decent child imagery? And what's really interesting is that there's a surprising dearth of research in this area. Despite anecdotally, a lot of clinicians and a lot of forensic psychiatrists and lawyers um, all saying, Claire, we get so many cases of people with autism who have been charged with this particular offence. And I was really surprised at the lack of literature. The, mo the bulk of the literature actually is uh, these two books I've put up on the screen here. The one on the left is, is I, re I thoroughly recommend both these books, by the way, but in particular, this one on the left. This book's called The Autism, Sexuality, the Autism Spectrum, Sexuality and the Law. And it's in three parts. The first part is um, almost like a, it's a case study, an autobiography of the young man, Nick Dubin. So this was a man... We've lost you, Claire. I think you've accidentally right. muted yourself. Yes, um, thank you. So it, oops. You got up to, it's an autobiography of Nick Dubin. Oh, thank you, thank you. This is an autobiography of Nick Dubin where he really explores in detail his experience of, um, his ch so he was diagnosed, I think I've missed that out, he was diagnosed with Asperger's um, after he was convicted of engaging in the viewing of indecent child imagery or child pornography. And he was in his kind of late 20s at the time. And so in this book, he really explores in significant detail how um, 
his autism symptomology really prohibited him from understanding what he was doing and what he was engaging in was actually wrong and was illegal. And I, I will say this, and I'm happy to say this on the record, that up until that point, I looked at autism and I looked at autism in relation to sexual offending, arson, fire setting, homicide, mass shooting, terrorism. But I, when I first picked up this book, I, I remained to be convinced at how someone may not appreciate that some of these things are illegal. But as I read this book, I became convinced, yes, definitely in a large proportion of people with autism that are charged with offend behaviour, that their behaviour can be explained by their autism symptomology rather than any malicious intent. They, they didn't know that what they were doing was wrong. And the, the second part of this book is Professor Larry Dubin, his father, talking about it from a legal perspective. And then the third part of the book is Professor Tony Atwood, who's a psychologist in Australia, really top, top psychologist in Australia in the field of autism, who talks about it in relation to autism symptomology as well. So I thoroughly recommend both these books. So most of the information that we got was from these two books. There was only a couple of other articles that were pertaining to child pornography and autism spectrum disorder. What the, the, the earth literature showed to date is that there are features of autism that link to this offending behaviour. And I'm going to briefly describe some of them. Today. I can, obviously can't go into a lot of depth because of the time, but I'm going to highlight some of the key ones. So many people with autism, they, they have a normal sexual interest. So they often turn to the internet as a means for, um, to, you know, to, to learn about sexual relationships and for sexual, a uh, sexual outlet as well, to, to, for, sec, to, you know, for the sexual material. And this may lead them on to other material. So obviously, as you know, when you go onto the internet, things pop up. So someone with autism might see things pop up and start to explore it, but they have unbridled curiosity. So they're not restricted by social taboos. So they might start to explore things without thinking, oh, actually that, that's that, I maybe shouldn't go into that or other people think that's wrong, so I better not do it. So they have unbridled curiosity. You know, they want to learn about things they're unrestricted by social taboos and before they know it, they're into all sorts of things. Um, and also there's this term called counterfeit deviance that's used in this context. And that's whereby the, the behavior the individual with autism is exhibiting by engaging as a behavior is not driven by malicious intent or motive, rather it's driven by um, the curiosity and lack of understanding of what they're doing. They also have an inability to enter it social mores and legal rules. They may not understand that something's wrong. I mentioned this before, but empath empathetic impairment. So people with autism do have empathy, but it's, it's they're impaired in corners of empathy, not effective empathy. They also are, um, they can, so you can have a person with autism as well that's 27 years old. So they're chronologically maybe functioning at level in terms of their employment and their intelligence but their social maturity may be that of someone much, much younger. So you may have a 27 year old man who has the social maturity of someone who's like 14. So you can imagine that individual may be more drawn to younger people. They can talk to, they feel more comfortable talking to them. They, they're engaging in the same kind of topics of conversation. And naturally they may want to learn about sex and sexual relationships from someone that they can naturally kind of talk to comfortably. And as you can imagine in this, I'm sure I don't need to say in this room, how some of the difficulties that may arise as a result of that kind of aspect. People with autism as well may have a very literal thinking point of view with this offending behaviour as well. So often you hear an individual with autism that's been charged with this offence say, well, you know, I was able to access the material readily online. How can something that's so freely accessible be illegal? And also they, could, they have impaired theory of mind um, often, so they may not appreciate that that this behaviour is wrong, um, that you know that actually there's a victim there, and they might not appreciate the broader consequences. So, like, how do those images come to be? Um, what are the consequences and implications? We've lost you again, Claire. Yeah, I think That's someone it. keeps hosting me. Uh, someone what? keeps muting me. I don't know what it is. <laughs> um, so they might not understand the broader context of how that image came to be. Who might else have access to that image and how it might be used. There's also, and that links to as well, the fact that when you're viewing that image, an individual with autism, they, they typically have, not all, but they tend to have impairment and be able to recognize facial expression. 
and this is hugely supported by a, a significant amount of empirical literature. So they, they, they particularly have difficulty with recognising a distressed or upset expression. And you can imagine that, that not being able to recognise that, again, that's another thing that makes it harder for that person to realise that what they're engaging in is potentially illegal and damaging to someone. They also have potential difficulty with correctly guessing age. So people with autism largely struggle with this. And you can imagine that the media and you know, these child pornography websites and other websites make this even more difficult given that they often try to make pictures of young models. So young 14, 12 year old girls, 10 year old girls and younger look a lot older. So they make these minors look like they are, you know, uh, above 16 and 18. And likewise, they make older models look really young. And that really blurs the distinction between what is appropriate and what's not for these people with autism as well. So I've just touched on some of the kind of key things in some of the thoughts that may lead to them engaging in suffering behaviour. Unwittingly known that it's actually against the law and it's there's harm caused to someone as a result of engaging in this potentially. These are two examples of images here of a young model that's made to look a lot older. And this, is, this was a model in France and it was on the front page of a magazine and it brought huge controversy you know, about how inappropriate this was. And again, here I speak to you know, a number of people who learn disabilities and autism in both. And I always ask them, what age do you think that girl is or that person is in that image? And they, it's very interesting. Many of them say 16, 15, 18, early 20s. They really, really do struggle with really guesstimating this um, in, in a way that a neurotypical may be able to. This also links to the need for a structured risk assessment that's appropriate for people with autism. And, it, and I'll, I'll, I'll try and cut this down if I realise I'm talking a lot here. But current risk assessments for any type of crime for people with autism is just not appropriate for a number of reasons. The main reason being that they're just not normed on this group. So they don't consider the same protective factors and risk factors that are in people with autism that aren't in necessarily neurotypical population. And also risk assessments as they stand don't take consideration of how the autism may have contributed to behaviour. I'll give you one example. So many people with autism who are charged with this offending behaviour tend to have been found with thousands of images, you know, far more than what you'd expect in a, a neurotypical, not even opened. And the typical also tend to be really categorised. So into like hair colour or setting or scene or individuals. And it's more that act of categorising and collecting that ritualistic aspect of autism that's really driving that collection of, of, of images or videos than the actual gaining any sexual gratification per se. Not always, but I'll, this, is very, this is very frequently the case. And what's important to consider is that risk assessment tool would actually view the, the excess of material as being a really risk indicator the high likelihood that the individual will actually act on that behaviour. The more images that you have, the, the argument is the more likely you are to act on that. Now, no studies support this in neurotypical populations, let alone in people with autism, which is probably even less likely the case in people with autism. And as I mentioned, risk assessment tools do not take into consider features that are more risk or protective in people with autism that aren't in the normal population of individuals, like social awareness, vulnerability, their vulnerabilities, their unusual interests, and other issues like that. So there is, there is a real need for a risk-sensitive autistic tool for any, any individual to engage in any type of offend behaviour. It currently doesn't exist. So as a result, many people with autism who are otherwise low risk are actually looking of high risk, and this has huge detrimental implications for that individual. This is a really interesting paper I did with some great colleagues in Australia, um, Dr. Sally Kennedy and Dr. Ian Warren. We did a paper where we're really interested in looking at cases in Australia, because Australia is actually really quite forward thinking in particular in relation to autism and um, a offending. And I think that's driven largely by people like Felicity Jerry and, and Professor Penny Cooper and, and, and others, um, Ian Freckleton. Tony Atwood, these are great people in the field. And we were really interested in what is, how is autism considered in, in the trial of individuals who are charged with offending behaviour? 
And what we found was in, in the cases we looked at, there was huge vulnerability. So some judges didn't consider it at all important, whereas some were considered it more as a mitigating factor. So that vulnerability really and really highlighted the need for some sort of assessment or means to kind of, you know, more training is needed effectively and understanding. Because I come across, even in the UK, a number of solicitors that don't consider the autism in their client as being important. I've even spoken to psychologists that are expert witnesses who have found significant um, impairments in terms of autism in, in the individual, yet I've argued that it's not important to look at in relation to the fine behaviour. It didn't bear any, any um, impact. And I, I would really challenge that. How can you distinguish or dis disentangle the autism symptomology from the offending behaviour? Um, I just don't think it can be done. And again, the issue of mildly autistic um, almost negates the importance of looking at that disorder in that client. It's, it's almost like, well, there's no point in looking at it. Um, and I think that's really damaging because, as I mentioned before, that, you know, the, the strengths and weaknesses, they can have significant impairments but actually be very verbally articulate and very verbally intelligent. I have a person that I'm working with as an expert witness who is significantly you know, successful in their job, you know, hugely successful, hugely intelligent. And it's just everyone around them, uh, lawyers and everyone's just like, well, well, if you're that intelligent, that professional, how can you not have understood that what you did was wrong? And again, that's why it's so critical that you do look at these kind of factors I'm looking at. Um, in relation to in relation to that individual, also it's really important. I'm going to look at now terrorism. There are studies that have shown that people that are small anecdotal studies that have shown that people with autism are potentially more vulnerable to being radicalised and engaging in extremism. And I know this is very controversial, but there's a huge number of reasons for this, which I would love to have gone into in more detail. But I'm aware of the time. Um, but I would what I want to do is signpost you all to some really good literature in this area. One of the key people in this field is Dr. Zainab Alatar, and she wrote a number of excellent works um, that showed how um, different push and pull factors in people with autism to engaging in uh, terroristic behaviour or, in, you know, be, you know, becoming radicalised online. And I'm really happy for people to get in contact with me to share this material. And in her paper in 2020, she talked about seven different facets of people with autism that she sees as pull and push factors for engaging in terroristic behaviours or um, engaging in becoming radicalised online. And these are listed here. And a lot of them link in to the kind of things that I've been talking about already up until this point. I also really want to highlight uh, a works by Dr. Zena Bellatar. She created this framework for assessment of risk and protection in offenders on the autism spectrum. And this is a tool that's not to be used as a risk assessment tool, Rather, it's a supplementary aid to risk assessment. So she's acknowledged the gaps that are in current risk assessments for people with autism. And she's like looked at those gaps and addressed them in this work. So she looks at all these kind of different facets here in relation to risk and protection of people with autism. I'm going to turn to, I'm going to try. Um, Fusty, can I have another four minutes if that's possible? Is Go on possible? then, four Thank minutes. You. I'm so yes. sorry. I'm Go so on sorry. Then. Not at all. Thank you. It's I okay. Want to, I want to talk about autism in the, in the courtroom context and how it's so important to, you know, educate the judges, uh, the judge and the juror and what, and what have you, how as to how that person with autism may present and how their demeanour may actually be misperceived. So the behaviour, you know, looking away and um, not having eye contact, and I'm not saying not everyone, not everyone with autism will not have eye contact, but they may look away, they may fidget because they need to soothe themselves. Um, they may not have any emotional expression on their face. And all that kind of behaviour may, 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 may be perceived by the court as being um, evidence of guilt. And, for, you know, they, they have no remorse. They don't care for what they've done. Or they may, they may also have bizarre behaviours as well. I'm going to kind of provide some examples here. So they may, as I mentioned before, um, have no expression on their face when the victim, the alleged victim is talking about what they've done. And it's really important to highlight here that in people with autism, often they may not express what they actually feel inside. 
And so they could be feeling really upset inside, but not, not ex being expressed. And it's really important to highlight that to the court as well. They may have unusual ways of speaking. So they may speak very monotonously without intonation. They may speak very rapidly. They may speak all of a sudden very loudly or very quietly. And all that needs to be kind of explained to the court as well. They may also have very unusual behaviours in court. So they may, um, there's a case where a, a young guy uh, the defendant with autism opened a book and started reading it. Um, they may, but, and it's, uh, so, so many things I want to say, but as well, other things is they may, there's issues with compliance as well. So they may um, be too scared to say that what something, someone says is actually wrong because what's been found is people with autism actually have a higher need to please authority figures than the general population. They may also have the equivalence with time to respond. So uh, in a police context as well, if a, a person with autism is asked a question, they may take some time to respond, but it's not because they don't understand the question, it's just that they need more time to formulate their what they're thinking and to, uh, and often this is viewed as being them trying to think up in their minds a fake story or a fake response, but actually it's, it's, it's kind of common in this group, it's called Asperger time. And um, one last thing I'll mention is that there's also issues with, the, with memory in this group. And so this is important both from a police uh, investigative interviewing context and a court context, because people with autism really may often have difficulties with um, the sequencing of events and recalling that in the correct sequences. Or they may also have difficulty with um, episodic memory, so remembering when something occurred and where, whereas they might be completely able to remember what they were wearing and what they said, but they cannot remember at all where or when that event occurred. And you can imagine uh, under a police investigative context and a court context, this could look really guilty as well. So in summary, it's really important that when we have a person with autism in the court, that how their autism may have factored in is really taken into consideration on a case-by-case -case basis, regardless of whether that individual is mildly autistic or highly functional autistic. And as Ian Freckleton and colleagues have said, Colleen Berryessa, that um, this will mean that if that's done, that they'll, ha they'll have a fair hearing or fair proce proceedings. So I know I whistled to through that. I had no idea it would take so long. I'm so sorry, Fosti. Um, but that's what I, I was, was so much I wanted more to say. But what I'll say, everyone who's here, is that I've put all my details here to my Twitter feed and my research group profile. If there's any other information you would like or any papers that I've touched on or you want to have a chat with me, please do get in touch. I actually actively really encourage it because um, that was terrible. I whistled through that terribly. <laughs> I know um, you didn't. Not at all. Th thank you, everyone. Thank, thank you very you. much, Claire. So if you could stop sharing your okay. screen now, I'll just say to everyone that um, I'm not going to share my screen. And um, I'm, as ever, those of you who know me uh, know that I like to use these events as an opportunity. I hope we're still there. Yeah. Have, have we? Can you still hear me? Yes, yeah, yeah. still hear you. Honestly, no Sorry, problem. yes, my yes, computer okay. went a bit odd and I lost everyone. Sorry. Yes, so as those of you who know me, know I can speak for England as Claire can speak for Scotland. So we're going to keep going. There's some detail in the chat that I will talk about in the moment. I'm not going to share my screen, but I do want to talk to you about what I think are the three main areas that we need to think about in the criminal justice system. And I'm going to use Alex Henry as an example. So for those of you who know the Alex Henry case, he was um, convicted of murder by way of what was known as a joint enterprise. So he was accused of effectively joining in with someone else's crime. And his role in that was to throw a telephone. And what we know from what we've heard from Andrew and Claire is that if someone uh, has autism, they might also demonstrate some form of oppositional behavior. So we had the example of the person with the food tray. They might lash out, for example, if something happens that they find difficult to cope with. Equally, they may not understand what's going on around them in, in very fast moving events. And we um, restrict our uh, understanding of the state of mind in the 
English common law to questions of intention, recklessness and negligence, but on which doesn't accommodate issues around autism, but also on questions of fact. If it is alleged, as Claire has recognised, that someone understood what was going on at the time or could foresee what would happen from that situation, it can be a very different state of affairs for someone who is autistic. They may well not follow what's going on in fast moving events and certainly may not follow what someone else is thinking when they're accused of being complicit. So what are the three areas that we have to think about for somebody like Alex Henry, who's facing a murder trial, convicted of murder, we then discover that he is in fact autistic and in his appeal that diagnosis is rejected by the Court of Appeal and he remains in prison for murder uh, when he did not commit the killing and there is known expert evidence that he has the sort of cognitive difficulties that we've heard about from Claire. The answer is to change the way we approach the criminal justice system. And there are three areas, as I say, that I think are really interesting. The first is procedural adaptations. And a lot of us working in the criminal justice system are already uh, conscious of this. We already have training how to deal with um, children in the youth court, we have to have specific training, how to do, give effective participation to vulnerable persons, including those with autism and a range of other conditions um, in the way in which we approach their effective participation. That might include an intermediary. It might include an intermediary who assists with communication for a witness or for a uh, suspect or defendant. And there is a wealth of guidance now, thanks to um, Claire, Penny Cooper, Ian Freckleton, who I am in fact in chambers with in, in Melbourne, in Australia. Um, the uh, work of Penny Cooper in a range of judicial documents. There really is no excuse for judges not to know because there is a specific section in the uh, Equal Treatment Bench Book on Autism. The Criminal Practice Direction sets out very clearly how procedurally we should change the way that we uh, approach the courts and it is down to us to find out as Andrew said at the beginning to adjust ourselves to find out what that person needs and it may be as simple as saying well uh, I know from the assessment of you that you've got the problem with the colour green and to say to the court that we need to be accommodated without the colour green it may be much much more complex than that and then we do have this hurdle of trying to educate the whole of the courtroom to say this is not silly. The colour green is particularly significant. It isn't silly. We have to adjust. And you get a lot of judges and barristers who think they are the most important people in the room. And the way I try and approach it is that we have to think about the most important person in the room is the person who is autistic. And for me, defending in cases involving serious crime that is quite commonly my client whether that's an appeal or a trial so when I say in the room I suppose I mean in the case and we all have to adjust ourselves and not think that things like interpretive dance or colours green are silly that actually these can have significant and distressing consequences but also they might um, affect the way in which the person presents themselves particularly in a crown court trial to a jury or a senior court trial to a jury. So issue number one is effective participation, procedural adaptations. It requires us to be able to identify um, what the needs are of that particular person. And if you're defending someone, they may have got very, very good at hiding it. We, they may have been labelled high functioning, uh, but then they get involved in hacking and they're hacking uh, it obsessed with hacking into something and they're charged with hacking offences without any real understanding of, the, of their state of mind and we've seen that with Gary McKinnon for example. Um, and there's some really good guidance now, it's in the Equal Treatment Bench Book, it's in the Criminal Practice Direction, it's in the Advocates Gateway Toolkit and it's on the Autism Society uh, website so you can go to the advice and guidance topics for criminal justice professionals on the autism society website and uh, I'll certainly 
post the links in the article that we follow up with in the Libertas lens, but pretty easy, Google Autism Society Guidance Criminal Justice Professionals, and there's some really significant and fundamental changes that can be made to the way in which we approach the courts. And some of them might be um, it, simple. We all know about whether or not we need to be wearing wigs and gowns. You might find your autistic client actually finds it easier to identify who are the professionals in court if we keep our wigs and gowns on. We need to ask those questions and find out what we need to do. That involves expert evidence and it involves expert evidence very, very early. The second area is police interviews, of course, and Code C, as many of you will know, of the Police and Criminal Evidence Act, now doesn't just refer to mental health issues, but refers to mental vulnerability. So there is now, there are now provisions for quite some time that deal with mental vulnerability, and I'm sure those of you here today will can think of numerous examples as to when your client has not been picked up in the education system, the uh, first time that any issues with them are picked up is when they're in a police station and the police go and head an interview without any assessments of that person's issues and you have to deal with that as you go along um, in the course of what can be very, very serious allegations as we've heard from Claire. So a range of homicide, sexual offending, computer misuse, offences, terrorism, um, so the second area is really trying to understand how can we change? We've done really well to make a start on procedural adaptations in order to ensure people get a fair trial when they're charged. But then how do we change the way in which we approach police interviews that might have a significant effect on not charging people? That if we really understand autism in the way it works, how do we, it, it's not for us as lawyers to try and find ways to um, help someone who is autistic to understand they shouldn't be setting a fire. Our role is to say, well, should this person be charged at all? What is it about that person's presentation that means they ought to be assessed? And there's, there is a lot of psychiatric literature out there now on what needs to be done before those people are interviewed at all. And of course, we know that the Crown Prosecution Service has to apply a public interest test. So a prosecutor has to say, well, is there sufficient evidence? Is it in the public interest to prosecute? And it may be there, if the autism is understood, there isn't sufficient evidence to prove the mental er element required for the crime. And where there is, it may not be in the public interest to prosecute if that, one is that person is profoundly autistic. And these assessments need to be done up front because you might have an autistic child, you might have an autistic adult, you may have someone, as Claire and Andrew have told us, with a range of issues that isn't just autism. Uh, and by just autism, I'm not minimizing in any way. The third area that we need to consider as criminal justice professionals, then, is, and I've mentioned it already, really, is substantive law. What is the evidence of your client's autism that goes to the existing substantive law? But also, are we getting to a point now where we know so much about autism that we've got to think about uh, reform that allows for either reduced or responsibility for particular crimes for people who have autism or no responsibility at all? That the consequences for committing that behavior would be different. And obviously we've heard about some shocking uh, offending in some of the stories that Claire has told us today, but when one, it becomes really hard to think about um, how can we say for something so dreadful that that person is not responsible for that? Well, the answer is to understand autism and to have a system that engages in the needs of that person rather than imposing levels of responsibility and restriction, which is the system that we currently have. And that's not to be woolly and political, it's actually to be very, very scientific, to say, look, we've got a whole heap of science here, a whole body of research that's been going on for a very long time. How do we reform our criminal justice system to really understand the different levels of responsibility for people who have what is, frankly, already labeled neurodiversity. We understand diversity of human beings. We need to really understand diversity of brains. 
that people do think differently. And I often tell stories, for example, my daughter thinks in pictures and it sounds silly, but if you, if she goes onto YouTube and someone is playing a very complicated piano tune, she can play it. Incredible um, how she can play the piano in that way. Uh, but place sheet music in front of her, it's rather more difficult. And she has to find a way to learn to focus on that sheet music. And that's per my personal experience. That's not to suggest um, that that's the only example, but it's an example of, I understand that my daughter thinks in pictures. So we, and she's a fantastic artist and she's about to go to, off to university to study fine art. So she's totally talented, but she has different talents from me. I can sort of have a go at the piano and I'm pretty good at reading sheet music, but I couldn't possibly co copy someone on uh, playing the piano on YouTube. So we all think differently. And we happen to have some labels for the cer certain types of presentation, autism of which is one. And then I've had a client in a terrorism case who part of the evidence against him was the images that he had on his phone. And one of the images was a woman in a burqa. It, it was alleged as an Islamic ideology, so terrorism by um, uh, a, an alleged follower of ISIS. And on his phone was a picture of a woman in a burqa on a horse, a sort of medieval image with a sword. And that was being relied on as evidence of his support for the ISIS ideology, along with some other images on the phone. One of the things we had to do was work through the images that the prosecution would rely on and try and say, we can't rely on this one. This actually has nothing to do with ISIS. So I had a look for her and she turned out, I asked him, who's this? And he said, oh, that's Kaula in Bint Al Aswar. And so I thought, well, I wonder who she is. So I looked her up and she's the equivalent of Joan of Arc. She's the Islamic Joan of Arc. She's an amazing character in Islamic history and if I had Joan of Arc on my phone no one would turn a hair but because he has the equivalent of Joan of Arc on his phone the prosecution is seeking to rely on it in in a criminal trial and we had to use the expert to demonstrate that this particular image really was irrelevant to those those proceedings and we had to do that in front of the jury the prosecution decided to lie, rely on that image. And it's one of the great, my favorite moments in my career because the article where I learned to understand about her was an article about a badass female warrior. So I got to say badass female warrior in a, in a criminal court, in a terrorism trial, which, which always amuses me. So in the, in the most complicated of cases, particularly in my view in joint enterprise and cases like Alex Henry's, we currently have a system where autism is not recognized and where in his case, we have that shocking rejection of his diagnosis. So before you even get to considering whether or not he was complicit in what was alleged, you haven't even stopped to uh, accept that he is living with these complications that Claire has described and the system has not adapted itself in the way that Andrew has described to consider how we deal with uh, people accused of very serious crime and who whose diagnosis if it's made has a significant impact on their intention their contemplation of what's going to happen their knowledge of the essential facts all of which are relevant elements in complicity. Knowledge of the essential facts is required. If it's an overwhelming supervening act case, then contemplation is an issue. And knowledge of the essential facts has to be subjective, not objective. And for those of you, I'm not giving the Jogi lecture today, those of you who understand the law on complicity can start to see how the mental elements appear in a number of different ways. And intention might appear in two or three different ways if it's alleged that someone is complicit in murder. So we're really not doing this very well. We've made a start on pr procedural adaptations. Alex Henry's case is a really good one to look at and think about how badly we are dealing with people with autism in the context of murder, and particularly those alleged to have either shared an intention with someone else or been an accessory in some way that I, I'm, I'd be bold enough to suggest that in most murder trials up and down the country, there is somebody um, who is, who's 
issues are not being recognised on the issue of complicity and therefore juries are not being told what they need to know in order to understand whether that person is in fact uh, guilty or, or not. So I wanted this and it, it's gone on a lot longer than we said it would but never mind. I wanted this lecture to really bring those things together because Alex Henry's case is there out, out there to read and it is I think the most shocking example of where the system goes wrong because for a court of appeal to hear from Professor Simon Baron Cohen and reject his diagnosis means that we are on the back foot in every single case that involves issues of autism. You've got a court of appeal demonstrably rejecting a diagnosis that we can see from the um, information that we have from Andrew and Claire today would be absolutely vital to understand in a criminal trial. So what does that say to all the other people with autism who are accused of criminal offences is we've got a system that is not recognising um, the importance of the system altering to accommodate what we now know about neurodiversity. So I'm also bold enough to say that I suspect our prisons are full of people with autism who remain undiagnosed and it's unrecognised and they may have other issues that are just described as challenging behaviour or conduct disorder or oppositional behaviour. Whereas in fact, if we all adjusted ourselves, those of us who may or may not also be on the, on the spectrum to try and uh, do, do the things that we think are silly, do the interpretive dance because it makes you challenge yourself as to how you can do things differently. What is it that we need to do? So you can start with reading the material, the Equal Treatment Bench Book, the Autistic Society Guidance, the Advocates Gateway Toolkits, um, or the academic material, including the book that Claire is waving for, on, uh, for us on the, on the camera. All of these resources we will put in the article um, when we post it as part of the Libertas Lens. So just to go back to the chat, uh, I'm sure you've all read it, but the first item in the chat is the link to signing up for our Libertas article so that you'll be able to receive what we do. It'll take us a month or so to put it all together so it's properly done and there's, because there's another edition in between, but it will be coming. Next, we've got Johnny Howarth, who says he's a tech, who's, hi Johnny, good to see you. Um, he's a television producer and journalist developing a dram dramatic TV series on joint enterprise and autism working closely with Charlotte, Jan and me. Um, I think you can leave the amazing for Charlotte and Jan, but um, there he's given you his contact details um, to contact him if you're interested in that. And you can see his telephone number there. So Johnny Howarth, I think you're also on Twitter, Johnny. So put your Twitter handle in the um, chat. Um, we then have someone on their iPhone who says, Our, look at our shocking Alex Henry appeal. There's no accountability for our judiciary. Well, I do think there's a lot of learning and I don't know how many judges are in fact trained on the contents of the Equal Treatment Bench Book. I would love this webinar to be played to the judges when they next go to their conferences, but um, I, I think they should listen to me all the time. But I think it requires us to be oppositional. I, I really think that's what we need to be doing. However painful we are in court, and if it means that we're verbose and we talk too long, we've got to be oppositional. We've got to make sure that this is understood, not just by the judiciary, but by the other barristers in the room as to why we need to take the time to do this properly. Um, and and ben, what, yes. what you're saying there, look, we've got 71 people still on this presentation now. Right, thank you for staying. Uh, if every one of those 71 people made an individual change themselves that didn't require a huge amount of resource, didn't require lots of money, just required perhaps a different way of thinking or a new method of, you know, addressing a solution, uh, addressing a problem, that myriad of those individual changes um, could really have a significant effect for people who are within a particular population or a community before we get what I've described in the chat as macro level changes taking place, which effectively are those things that need to be changed in society, laws or policies or procedures. Um, so, so even us as individuals, I think, can really make a difference to the person who is in front of us 
in a small way, but us all making a difference to one person really does make a difference to a community and to a population. Yeah, thank you, Andrew. And there's something really important from Ben here. The next one I was going to read is how when you have raised all of this and you really have done your job properly and Ben's gone bent over backwards to make sure everything is in court, his client's convicted, and then you get a media report that says someone has claimed to have autism. And I do think that's the fallout from the Alex Henry case at the moment, not least that he's still in prison. Um, but also the fallout is to see a court of appeal not accepting a diagnosis from the eminent professor who's diagnosed him um, has that knock on effect that unless the judiciary are seen to be accommodating what the uh, the knowledge base is, the academic material and the research that we know exists, the knock on effect is the headlines that we see, unless there is this type of education also for the media, we can see uh, from Ben how that can be uh, uh, used in media headlines. And then that affects public knowledge. So that's, and for example, someone living with autism may think, well, no one's going to believe me. So they might hide that or accept, attempt to hide their obsessional behaviors, which then would be perceived as dishonesty or further criminal activity. Um, Suzanne has had uh, experience with her son in court. First words out of the magistrate's mouth was, look at me, look at me, I'm the one that's important. And someone might not be able to look at another person. Um, I, I, and in busy courts, you can see immediately how that might, reaction might come. There's a, magistrate with a full court with a massive list and somebody who's not engaging and it does require us to slow down and make sure that each individual is accommodated and I imagine it's a significant problem in the magistrates court although I must say it's a relatively long time since I've been there um that's not entirely true actually I did an online committal the other day so but you get the point um and there we have the Advocates Gateway link, thank you very much so, uh, from someone in the chat, all the toolkits on the Advocates Gateway, um, two, more than two decades of work that's given us the wonderful intermediary system that has at least begun to spread that message. The visibility of intermediaries in court, I think is making a significant difference to the understanding, particularly of professionals who attend court, that um, we need to adjust the way we do something. There's a link to the American Bar Association. Um, yes, it's a great resource. The American Bar Association ahead of us, Ian Freckleton's work on evidence that we've seen ahead of us. Um, Suzanne says, why isn't everybody doing this? Well, look, the guidance is there, the training is there, the criminal justice system is enormously slow and that's why we have events like this. And we're not the only set of barristers chambers, we're not the only a set of legal professionals but what we've brought together here that I think is unique and important is health professionals, um, autis autism e experts and myself having worked in the criminal justice system and being involved in the development of those those toolkits. So and, Andrew, and I wouldn't I wouldn't add? beat themselves I wouldn't beat people shouldn't beat themselves up too much about this who in this professional capacity because I can tell you within health within social care um, within other public sectors people will be having the same sorts of discussions about how do we make our services better for people who need particular ad adaptations so you know in the health sector if you come to an emergency department um, you're going to have to get booked in at the reception desk. Then you must go and see the triage nurse. The triage nurse want, might want to immediately talk to you, check your blood pressure, check your pulse, uh, prick your finger to check your glucose. If you're somebody that has a particular condition that is not used to following those instructions because somebody else has told you to do it, and it has to be in the order that the system wants it to be in, um, you're not going to respond very positively to that. Now, actually, I've used a really extreme example because uh, from the health sector, because I think and I hope that we're much more used to treating people as individuals. But let's look at that same person in the judicial system, if they're in custody or not, and they have to appear in court. It's very regulated, isn't it, about where you have to stand, who you have to look at, um, in what order things happen, when you have to stand up, when you have to sit down, when you're allowed to speak, when you're not allowed to speak. If you've got neurodiversity, that may be overwhelming. And 
making a difference for that individual might be the difference between them cooperating or not or actually being heard or not but more fundamentally it might be the difference that other people in that room need to hear so that they can then cascade that el those changes elsewhere and make much more of a difference to other people who are not present yeah absolutely i think probably what i'd like to say is when we think about challenging behavior it's us that needs to be challenged and it is an enormous challenge. And it is because we're beginning to understand neurodiversity better. And I, from what I've seen in the chat, there is a real interest in this area. And we've got a mixture of people who work in the system and who've been affected by the system, which is fantastic to have. Great to have you all here. And thank you all for the resources. There are a number of other people who've posted resources in the chat. So um, I'll try and capture those before I, I, I turn them off and make sure that we give you uh, uh, those resources. We're all contactable on this issue. Um, and I think it's just been, having gone on for so long, if anyone has any questions, this might be a good time to have a Q&A. We can't give you any advice about your particular case for those of you who've got cases going along. But if there's anything else that we could ask questions about that's relevant to this presentation, uh, do use the hand up facility. There's a way of using the reaction to put your hand up and we'll try and find you um, let me just quickly see something if yes go ahead Claire, while i'm looking to see if there's any hands up thank um, you um, i noticed one of the comments said about alexithymia yeah and it's been reported that it's as many as one in ten people with autism have it i think now, what does said, that mean for those yes who i thought know. i thought i thought i'd highlight that in case you read it and you weren't quite sure everyone so alexithymia is actually incre increasingly really recognized it's been really important to look at in regards to people who have been, who are being violent or offenders. And what it actually is, is that the person struggles to name or describe their feelings. So, or they have, you know, they, so they don't, they, they, you know, if you were to ask them, what does it, so people with autism already struggle with that. If you were to say to someone with autism, how do you know you're sad? What does it feel like? They already struggle with that anyway. But it's like even it's it's like added to that they actually don't even they can't even recognize it in their body but it's there the feelings are there and that you can imagine the troubles that cause but alexa thyma is, is, is a significant contributory role in people who have engaged in violent offend behavior in particular and it's becoming really really recognized so michelle i think it was from memory service michelle said that that's a really good point um, and and I, I noticed we have some really excellent people here today i see um, mark mahoney um, lawyer in the US is also here who's done oh, an great. piece yeah, on uh, autism and child pornography and um, one of the few papers that I mentioned I didn't mention your name Mark but there's like man, there's a two books and there's a couple of articles one of which is Mark's Mahoney's great work from 2009 Mark am I right um, but it's a great piece a great piece thank you at. well we'll add that we'll make sure we get all the resources so I think we can just end on the Libertas Chambers head of chambers Simon Choker the man with his hand up Simon can we hear you uh, yeah, th th thanks very much for the presentation. It's been extremely informative. But could I, could I just raise one issue which, which I've come across, and I, I imagine a lot of other barristers and solicitors have come across, uh, and it's, it's the fear, which is a, a realistic fear in, in some cases, that um, if you do get uh, an accurate diagnosis of an autistic spectrum disorder, it can make the, the position much worse for the defendant because the way the judge deals with it is to treat the defendant as dangerous. It may increase the likelihood that they have some form of indeterminate sentence or some form even of, of um, indeterminate hospital order. And is there anything you can say that would um, assist us in, re in relation to that balancing act about uh, whether we should really get to the bottom of, of what we can see are autistic problems and the desire to get the, the best outcome for a defendant? Yeah, I think I can answer some of that and then I'll hand over to um, Andrew and Claire. The, the first thing is, um, I think backtrack a little bit from the finding of dangerousness that might hap happen on sentence. that if you're using those diagnoses during the course of the trial, either for procedural adaptations or for uh, substantive issues in the trial, the first thing that tends to happen is that the prosecution use that challenging behavior as bad character. So um, 
issue number one is to try and exclude any evidence of your interview if that's been affected by the or, or may have been affected by your diagnosis. Issue number two is to challenge bad character applications by the prosecution and to call experts on those issues to make sure that the, the judge in the case has a handle on it, that the challenging behaviour comes from the sort of um, uh, issues that Claire has described here. So you, it does involve a judgment call. And obviously in a lot of cases, we don't do that. We think, oh, look, there's a whole heap of uh, social services records that show that this child has behaved badly. And if we use that report, the prosecution will use that material to show that they're, they've got bad character. So in the right cases, you've got to call the evidence to educate the room that that is not challenging behavior in the stereotypical Form. So you actually have to educate the room and you just have to make the judgment call if you're in the right case to do it. And so by the t if you're convicted, which hopefully you're not, by the time you get to sentence, that the understanding of the autism spectrum disorder is different. Now, it may be if we have, take the example of the fire setter that Claire gave us, it may be that that person has been undiagnosed for so long and exhibiting a range of issues that means that they are dangerous, or it may be that they've been totally misunderstood and the trial process reveals that. My answer to your question is that we have to be a little bit braver in challenging the approach of the prosecution and the judiciary, but I accept that there will be cases where that is a risk. But I think it's important to hand over to Andrew and then Claire to see what they have to say about that. So as a, I, I know I'm a paediatrician, but you know, as a qualified doctor, I, as a somebody who looks after the health of people in the population, what, what I um, really use as one of my own values is that everybody is an individual and it, we can look at why people do things and what the effect of what they have done. And it's really important that we, before we look at the effect of what they've done, work out why they've done it or why they haven't done it. So why somebody's acted or why they haven't acted. And, and I don't think there's any hard or fast rules here that we can use a broad brush across all patients or all people with a particular condition. I think we have to look at their individual needs. And I would always come back to the starting point of education because we've heard from Claire uh, at the start a re that really powerful comment once you've met one person with autism you've met one person with autism Th there's no way to to give a whole series of rules that would apply across the board for every single client you've got um, or every single witness that you've got and and I think a lot of this would have to start with educating those people in the room who are going to be either decision makers or who are going to be opponents or who are going to be contributing to the process in some way and trying to get that education in backed up by expert evidence when you need it early on. Because once people have formed a view, once people have, um, you know, decided their position in relation to somebody, it's going to be very difficult to change that view. And that, uh, you know, that occurs in the health service as well. You know, there are people, uh, who, teenagers who who had written in their medical notes, we'll just be cautious here because the last time they were here, they threw a chair at somebody. And, uh, you know, or they barricaded themselves in a cubicle or they locked somebody in a cubicle. And understanding why that happened in that particular case helps us to avoid it in the future. And, you know, the cases you're dealing with are a much more serious end, but it still comes back to this person is an individual. Let's try and understand their life and convince those other people in the room that that's important. Mm. Addressing our own biases and the systemic bias. I don't know how much time we've got left. It's six minutes past seven now. So I think because that was a question from our head of chambers, I'm going to take it as the last one. So I know others of you have got your hands up. But just to leave us with Claire on that final question of what is it, what is it harmful to raise our clients' conditions? Yeah, what do I, you I think, think about that? I think Sam, it's a really, 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 really. I think it's probably the, a paper needs written about it, written off. That's how important it is. That's my academic view. What I will say as well is that 
it is worth it. It is worth nevertheless mentioning because, particularly for low level offences or things like ch the viewing of indecent child imagery, where you can really argue with good expert witnesses that actually how the audits play the role, and that rather than a sentence, diversion measures that involve psychoeducation would be far more impactful. So if that, that person just needs to know and understand and be you know, taught, like here's the implications for what you're doing, um, here's what to avoid, here's how to say safe online or, you know, and that for, you know, or if they're, say for instance, if you, I mean, you have probably no doubt have come, in, come across many cases, as I speak to a lot of lawyers and, and friend psychologists that say, gosh, Claire, we get so many cases like this. So like a, a young, a guy with Asperger's who goes up to a woman, talks to her, um, he says, oh, nice, nice weather, isn't it? And she's like, yeah, yeah, and, and they're engaging in interaction. But the woman's actually getting increasingly more disturbed and what is wanting to get away. And this is like her facial expression, her body language would be fairly obvious to a neurotypical potentially. But this guy with Asperger's doesn't recognize it and he's still pursuing it. And he's, um, before you know, he's might have touched her or touched her in a thigh in a sexual way and he's got a sexual offense. And then this is like that. I would, you know, for example, the autism is very important to explain. And then you would just argue that um, this, this guy needs to have training in how best to approach people, what to say, how to recognize when people are not um, happy as advances, you know, how to maybe to ask certain questions like, do you want me to go? You know, just educate an individual on what's more appropriate, social appropriate and typical behavior. And because and, individuals, you know, they, they can learn. It's not like... Um, so for those kind of cases, so for certain cases, I think it's really important and with a good expert witness as well. But you're right, Simon, I think for some cases, it can be very difficult. Um, I, I think, think another, yeah, uh -huh. I, oh, I think that, no, no, not at all. Sorry to interrupt you, but no, it okay. occurred to me while you were speaking is that maybe what we do is issue a prize for the first judge to actually issue their reasons that includes those types of reasons that we've just mm -hmm. heard from Claire mm -hmm. that I have sentenced this person on this basis because mm -hmm. of these reasons and that That's has right. that contributes to educating the public so yeah. I, I think we'll leave it there it's now nine minutes past seven so that's a good hour and a half and a bit. I hope you've all enjoyed it. As I say, we'll follow up with articles. Simon is going to take the leading case to the UK Supreme Court, obviously. He's going to beat me there on why this is an issue for substantive law. Or maybe I'll take you on the race to find the judge, Simon, that can issue the reasons that is becomes the precedent for all the cases involving autistic spectrum disorder. In the meantime, enjoy your interpretive dance read the resources that we've had from Claire, particularly look up her project on the University of Salford website and look out for all the future um, Libertas webinars that we do with all our academics. Uh, in particular, we have with us today, Abby Carter, who's our um, next expert in our next webinar, which will be on uh, uh, war crimes and forensic archeology, span which is coming up um, soon and you'll read about that in our next Libertas Lens publication. So thank you everyone for coming. I hope it was interesting. I'm sorry we couldn't take as, as many questions as we would have liked to, but we will no doubt come back to this project uh, and uh, presentation again uh, sometime down the line in another webinar. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks, for Thank, Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank you, Claire. Thank you, Andrew. And thank I'm you, happy. Gary, for sticking with us and making sure we did all the admin. See you Thank at you. the next webinar. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank